Okay, we are now going to begin our second panel, which is on preparing for the deluge, planning and legal issues. And uh, it will be moderated by Leslie King O'Neill of the firm of Brassfield and Gord. Leslie. Thanks, Mike. Good morning, everyone. Um, I want to say uh, thank you to Mike Gerard for his um, assistance in putting together this program and particularly to Columbia Law School for hope, hosting us. Um, Mike and I were on the steering committee along with several other folks from both the American College of Construction Lawyers and American College of Environmental Lawyers um, to put together this program. And I want to say what a pleasure it was to get to work with many people from the College of Environmental Lawyers um, in the College of Construction Lawyers. And so it was really a pleasure working with them. And um, I hope that you all are going to enjoy it as well as much as we enjoyed working on putting it together. So yesterday, or the previous panel gave us a perfect segue because our panel discusses um, legal issues, and of course, being with two groups of lawyers, it wouldn't be a, a legal panel without some discussion of liability and legal responsibility, which um, we're going to have um, discussed this morning um, with uh, Elena Mihaly from the Conservation Law Foundation, um, and she's going to discuss whether climate change knowledge affects the standard of care for designers, constructors, developers, and owners. Um, and then we're very fortunate to have Janie Bavici from the New York Mayor's Office of Recovery and Resiliency to discuss how New York City is dealing with impacts from recent storms and climate change information and their climate resiliency design guidelines. Um, then we also have Dr. Jennifer Harado, who is the Director and Chief Resilience Officer with the Environmental Protection and Growth Management Group at Broward County, which is Fort Lauderdale in Florida, my home state, uh, to discuss the Southeast Florida Regional Climate Change Compact, which is um, a group of four counties and 110 cities which have been involved in voluntary collaboration since October of 2009 to try to work on climate change issues and she's also going to discuss the economic basis for action, the business of resilience. And then finally, we're fortunate to have Christopher Flavel from Bloomberg News, who writes on climate change issues, who is going to raise questions about what is being done, is it sufficient, and what else should we be doing or might we be doing to address these um, concerns. So I'm going to turn it over to Elena first. Sorry. Can everyone hear? The, yeah, this? Yeah. Great. And these, I can just go, okay. Good morning. Uh, thanks for everyone's attendance today and for inviting me here. My name is Elena Mahali. I'm a staff attorney at Conservation Law Foundation. Uh, CLF is a regional New England-wide environmental advocacy organization. We've been around for about 50 years. Uh, and we're headquartered out of Boston, but I actually hail from Vermont, uh, where I work out of our regional office. I have been asked to speak with you all today about a topic that CLF has been deeply engaged on, and that is how climate change is affecting and raising the standard of care for design professionals and others along the chain of building a structure, designing a structure, owning a structure, operating a structure, uh, financing a structure, etc. cetera. Uh, this is something that we've been doing a deep dive on for the past couple of years, and I usually give this presentation in about an hour, and today I have 15 or 20 minutes, so forgive the brevity and broad strokes. However, we just issued a report uh, earlier this year that is exactly on this topic, and I brought a whole bunch of copies, and they're uh, out on the front desk by the agendas, and I don't want to go home with them. So please uh, pick one up. So with the time that I do have, I'm going to speak briefly on this concept of how climate change is rising the standard of care for design professionals. I will focus on that group just because I don't have time to go into the whole uh, stakeholder chain, but uh, the report does go into those details. Uh, I'll speak specifically about some of the 
chapters in the report. I'll bring up a case that CLF, my organization, is actually bringing right now against ExxonMobil that tests out some of these theories. And I'll end with talking about how I think this is actually a great opportunity for collaboration between the legal and design community, as evidenced by this joint symposium. The climate is changing and will continue to change, as we heard from uh, Radley Horton this morning. And as a result, the historical climate trends can't simply be projected into the future as a basis for planning, designing, constructing, operating our infrastructure. Climate change will adversely affect the integrity of our built infrastructure. And when buildings get flooded, when roofs are blown off, when windows are bashed in, when there's loss of life, it is only human nature to want to try to find someone or some entity on whom we can point blame and from whom we can try and seek compensation. We saw this with the tobacco uh, industry. In the case of lung cancer, injured parties sued cigarette manufacturers. In the case of uh, mesothelioma, as was brought up earlier, we saw injured parties go after the asbestos manufacturers. Litigation has started in the uh, climate change realm against the large greenhouse gas uh, emitters, uh, mostly oil companies and utility companies. But as Michael Gerard was referencing earlier, even though there is a new uh, slew of cases that are taking state level claims to court, uh, we have not yet uh, seen a lot of success with this model. Likewise, uh, trying to recoup uh, remedies from municipalities and governments has proven difficult because of sovereign immunity. So because of these challenges of sovereign immunity, of uh, justiciability, preemption, immunity for the, the lawyers in the crowd, uh, there's a growing attention around the liability of individuals along the chain of design, construction, and sale of built infrastructure. People are beginning to ask the questions like, is an architect negligent if he or she fails to contemplate climate change in the design of a building? Is an engineer abiding by good engineering practices if he or she doesn't do a sea level rise analysis for a building that is going to be built on the coast? And likewise, is the design, uh, is the standard of care for developers and owners impacted by how much we now know about climate change? This is a flooded parking garage in uh, Florida with an octopus floating in it. Uh, and I think that this photo helps to cue up an important question, which is the octopus in the parking garage the new elephant in the room? <laughs> or as this New York Times article explores, what are the consequences when rising seas and corresponding flooding are no longer a risk, but actually a certainty? We can all likely think about the design of a building in our community and question the soundness of certain engineering choices. Was it really rational to put all the electric equipment at the bottom of the internal revenue source building, right, services building, or to build a CVS without ceiling supports to create more floor space in an area known to get heavy snowstorms, or to build a hospital with no operable windows in a place where Loss of power brings temperatures skyrocketing into the over 100 degrees within hours. CLF has been leading research over the last year to try to ascertain why those decisions were made. Is it that these irrationalities didn't appear at the time that the structure was designed? Or is it a lack of awareness or willingness to invest in more resilient design? What if choosing to design a climate-ready structure isn't just a luxury, a niche practice, or a part of some uh, occasional design competition, but it is actually the standard of care that is owed to the client. This latter question is something that CLF has been exploring, and the case law is evolving on this issue, but you will see over the rest of my presentation that climate change is clearly imposing a higher standard of care on design professionals and other stakeholders involved in the construction and sale of infrastructure. As I mentioned earlier, uh, CLF has been digging into this topic for the last year or so through traditional case law analysis and also hosting a series of workshops with uh, lawyers, thanks to the Sabin Center for uh, about a year ago, holding a symposium of lawyers talking about this subject. Uh, also with design professionals and government officials who are wrestling with this topic on the ground. 
Uh, the report was published uh, just in January, as I said, pick up a copy at the front. It's divided into four parts. The first three parts are a legal primer going over this concept of uh, failure to adapt uh, liability. And uh, we talk about specific stakeholders. Part four is a summary of uh, the proceedings from our workshops. Today, I'm just going to really touch on part one and even just a small part of part one. Uh, but feel free to ask me questions about it afterwards. So I want to dive into this negligence, because I think this offers the best example of this standard of care notion. Common law requires that every individual act in such a way so that they don't unreasonably harm those around them. If some form of harm does occur, that person could be held liable for negligence if four things happen. I should quiz some law student that's in here that's taken torts recently. This is probably bringing back flashbacks to all those of us that went to law school. There's four elements of negligence, duty, breach, causation, harm. I'm going to focus on the duty element, which is the uh, premise that I owe someone a duty of care, a, a responsibility to act in a certain way so I don't hurt them. Now, there's no book that courts look to and flip through and find engineer and read what the duty of care is. Rather, it's a, site, it's a, it's a case specific determination that is come to based on analyzing a number of factors. I've highlighted five factors here that courts typically look at, uh, but there are more that uh, I want to focus on and talk about how climate change is impacting each of those. So at first, a court would look at the standards that are written into a contract. This is kind of the go-to first place. There could be something in the contract that says that the bridge will be built to a 25-year design life, or we will use hurricane straps. That's a good place to start to ascertain the standard of care. Second, courts will look at what the design professional knew about climate change or should have known. Emphasis on that last part. Were there publicly available flood or storm surge maps? Was there a recent climate vulnerability study? Did the professional engage a climate expert? Design professionals often hire uh, specialists to do certain analyses, such as a acoustical engineer who might ascertain whether you are meeting the noise ordinances. More and more folks, folks are beginning to engage these climate experts. Courts will also look at the uh, applicable underlying codes, the building code, the zoning code. What's important to note is that these may function as evidence of what the standard of care is, but these do not necessarily mean that you won't be held liable. Following the code is the baseline for a negligence claim. It could be higher. The important question to ask is if the code or standard actually contemplates future climate change impacts, imminent climate change impacts. So for example, the Australian Building Codes Board released this report, which stated that the current building code is likely to be deficient in some areas. The paper noted that the National Construction Code does not currently address hail, storm tide, or have specific requirements relating to heat stress. Similarly, here's a wind design uh, chapter from the Australian New Zealand standard that explicitly in this highlighted section says that the wind speeds provided are based on an analysis of existing data. No account has been taken of any possible future trend in wind speeds due to climate change. So the takeaway, whether or not the code explicitly says that it doesn't contemplate climate change or implicitly by omission doesn't contemplate climate change is very important. And following the code is not necessarily a shield to liability. Fourth, courts will look at the industry custom. What are others doing? This may serve as a useful guide of dictating the standard of care, but ultimately the court makes the call. And the underlying theory is that just because a lot of people are engaging in unreasonable behavior, this does not necessarily make the behavior reasonable. This theory comes from an old admiralty law case from the 30s, the TJ Hooper case, the tugboat case. Here you had a tugboat owner that uh, went out and did not Siri, Siri wanted to weigh in on that one. <laughs> um, the tugboat owner did not have radios on ship uh, and as a result got caught in a storm that had they had the radios, they would have known that a storm was coming and probably come into shore. They got caught in it and two barges ended up sinking and the barge owner sued the tugboat owner for liability, uh, negligence. 
The tugboat owner came back to the court and said, look, industry-wide, people weren't really carrying radios, so that wasn't the standard of care, and I didn't have to do that. And Judge Learned Hand famously came back and said, you know what, a whole calling may have unduly lagged in the adoption of new and available devices, but courts, in the end, get to say what is required. And there are precautions that are so imperative that even their universal disregard by an entire industry will not excuse their omission. The takeaway here is that it's important to look further than just what the industry standard is. It's important to ask whether the use of a certain technology like thicker window glass or employing climate modeling may be imperative to guard against serious risk. What is the cost benefit ratio of adopting that enhanced standard? And have some others, even if not holistically, have some others in the industry adopted the approach? Finally, courts will look at the foreseeability of the harm. They'll ask whether a reasonable design professional knew or should have known that something like this could happen. This case talks about how sometimes people are held to a standard of even foreseeing things that have not yet happened before. You had a shopping center where a concrete pylon blew down in the wind and toppled on top of a customer walking into the store, and they were seriously injured. The customer brought a claim against the engineer saying, you're negligent for building this concrete pylon not strong enough to be able to handle the wind. The engineer came back and said, judge, I looked, and wind speeds of, this, of that magnitude had never, ever occurred in that location. And the judge came back and said, sorry, based on scientific knowledge available at the time of design, winds of that magnitude uh, were reasonably foreseeable. And based on your profession, which in large part exists to prevent harm to the public from structurally unsafe buildings, we're holding you to a standard of care to have foreseen those conditions could occur. The takeaway here is that Privity of contract is not a prerequisite to claiming liability. That engineer did not have a contract with that customer walking in, but there's an obligation and a standard to third parties. Same for designing and adapt, even if you're adapting the building that you, that you want to adapt, what, what implications could that have to adjacent properties? Again, takeaways here, thinking about whether a climate event has happened before is important, but it's also important to look forward and think about what's foreseeable based on the science. There are other theories of liability against design professionals and others in this stakeholder chain that I don't have time to go into today. But the fourth bullet on this list is this notion that standard of care concept lives in negligence, common law, but it also lives in general duties that are contained in statutes uh, or regulations. An example of this is a case that CLF has brought against ExxonMobil. It's a Clean Water Act case. The Clean Water Act, oh, this is a good map showing you just where the, the ExxonMobil terminal, uh, oil and storage terminal, it's located in Everett, Massachusetts, just north of Boston. The Clean Water Act requires that discharges uh, of pollutants to navigable waters get a NPDES permit. That permit requires them to employ certain best management practices, and one of those is to have what's called a spill prevention control and countermeasure plan. Those plans have to be reviewed and certified by licensed professional engineers who attest that the plan is in accordance with good engineering practice. As I said, the Everett Terminal stores, generates, handles uh, hundreds of gallons of toxic and hazardous chemicals. It's located in a place where a Category 1 storm would completely inundate the facility. Four foot or greater sea level rise also would flood much of the facility. Exxon itself, in reports to EPA, notes that given the terminal's location, a security incident leading to a release at the terminal would likely have catastrophic effects on both human life and the environment. This is a photo of storm surge along the Boston coast right near that terminal just in March of this year. This threat of sea level rise, storm surge, it's neither far away or in the future. It's right here, right now. And Exxon's spill uh, prevention and control and countermeasure plan makes no mention of climate change, no mention of sea level rise, no mention of storm surge, no mention of increased precipitation at all. So 
CLF is holding Exxon accountable. Uh, and we uh, filed a suit that has Clean Water Act claims, also RICRA claims. Uh, and we are saying it is not good engineering practices to ignore climate change and leave the residents of Everett like sitting ducks in the next storm. We also have a similar case against Shell for a terminal they have in the Providence, ter uh, Providence area. As I said, CLF hosted a series of workshops uh, with design professionals and government officials to gave a, gauge awareness around this standard of care issue and see what uh, on the ground struggles they were facing. Some interesting st uh, findings came out of uh, that those workshops, which are, uh, as I said, memorialized in this report, but 45% of respondents said that they had felt pressured at one time or another to ignore climate-related issues with a project for fear that they would not would not get the job. So obviously there's a need to uh, find some synergy between what the design professionals want to do versus what the owners are asking and willing to pay for. CLF is continuing work in this area. We're uh, right now engaged in a really interesting stakeholder group to explore standards and codes in uh, Boston and Massachusetts, thinking about the statewide building code and making it more resilient so that designers can rely on it. And to conclude, I think my main takeaway is that the standard of care expected of design professionals and others is rising due to climate change and improvements in climate science. The threat of liability is not just theoretical. There's already litigation in this space. And while CLF's Exxon case is uh, focusing on a general duty in the Clean Water Act, there are other general duties in environmental statutes. Uh, and the same theory could be presented in a tort context. So practices have to evolve to deal with this liability. Because as Radley was saying before, um, actually, the threat of liability can turn what is deemed just possible into the actual standard. More and more owners are seeing the upside of branding for resilience, and there's a really positive opportunity for the design and legal community to work together. Thank you. <clears throat> Slide change here. <clears throat> Thank you, Elena. So our next speaker is Janie Bafishi from the uh, New York City Mayor's Office. Thanks, Leslie. And thanks so much for the organizers for having me here today. I feel like it is prudent to let you know that I am not a lawyer. However, I am married to one, so I don't know. That might make me just as qualified. Um, I wanted to give you an overview of um, New York City's uh, climate resilience uh, agenda, what we're working on, and specifically our climate resilience design guidelines, which we released as preliminary last year and then recently released a, a version two of. Um, unsurprisingly, Hurricane Sandy was a pivotal moment in New York City's climate action agenda. Um, Hurricane Sandy struck, of course, in October of 2012. 44 lives were lost. Um, over 90,000, close to 90,000 buildings were in the inundation zone. Um, two million people lost power for two weeks or more. Um, and we incurred uh, the, the Sandy cost, $19 billion um, worth of damages across the city. As we think about how to uh, address the risks um, that Sandy exposed, we are also really aware that we're not just solving um, for, uh, for extreme events, but um, we know that Sandy exacerbated challenges that many communities already face, whether it's inadequate um, infrastructure, uh, lack of affordable housing, um, existing of environmental hazards, and the list goes on. Um, and of course, we are also aware of the challenges that we will continue to face as we look forward, um, in particular, a growing population that will create increasing demands for our infrastructure and services um, in the city. We expect 9 million people in the city by 2040, up from about 8.5 million that we have now. 
we're also solving not just for another Sandy, um, but but also the chronic risks of climate change. Um, I know Radley spoke earlier, so um, I unfortunately missed the panel, but we have the privilege in uh, New York City to work with um, an independent panel of scientists called the New York City Panel on Climate Change that provide with provide us with uh, projections um, around a range of risks on a regular basis. Um, so the NPCC has projected that New York City will, will uh, experience a 4.1 to 5.7 degree Fahrenheit increase in average temperature, a 4 to 11 percent increase in, in average annual precipitation, and that sea level rise will rise by 1 to 2 feet, and that's by the 2050s. Um, by 2100, high-end projections for sea level rise are up to 6 feet. Um, so clearly the, there are um, enormous challenges and risks that we have to address. And just to give you a sense um, of you know, the data that we were working with and our growing risk, prior to Sandy, the best indicator of New York's vulnerability to coastal flooding was the uh, FEMA 1983 flood maps. Um, they were based on outdated topography and weather data and were digitized in 2007, but the data did not change. But even in that effective floodplain, there were th 36,000 buildings and 218,000 residents. You can see here um, that Sandy demonstrated our vulnerability and highlighted how out of date those maps were. Um, the orange uh, on this map shows the Sandy uh, inundation area. So more than half the buildings impacted by Hurricane Sandy were outside the effective floodplain. So FEMA was in the process of updating the flood maps when Sandy hit, and in 2013, FEMA released preliminary flood insurance rate maps. The new flood plan includes larger portions of all five boroughs with significant expansion in Brooklyn and Queens. Uh, the population and the buildings in this flood plain almost doubled since the 1983 effective flood maps. Uh, to ensure that you know, structures rebuilt after Sandy were using the best available information and data, the New York City Building Code now requires that new and substantially improved buildings to use the preliminary uh, flood insurance rate maps. But actually, New York City appealed these maps based on modeling errors and, um, and, and won. And so we're currently working with FEMA on revised flood maps, as well as a new product, a future flood, uh, flood map product, which is a first of its kind uh, planning product. And we're actually still defining exactly what it is. And in the meantime, we have the benefit of the projections of the New York City Panel on Climate Change. And so this is um, uh, gives you a sense of the expanding risk that New York City faces. You can see clearly in the orange, red, purple, and pink um, that the, the floodplain will continue to increase. Um, and over 171,000 buildings and 1.2 million New Yorkers are projected to live in the floodplain by 2100. And of course, um, uh, sea level rise and storm surge are not the only risks that New York City faces. Um, so we are also actively addressing our risk to extreme heat and intense precipitation. This map in particular shows the vulnerability to extreme heat. Um, the most vulnerable areas, as you can tell, are in South Bronx, northern Manhattan, and central Brooklyn. Uh, we uh, developed this map not just accounting for physical indicators of risk, but also social indicators of risk. And in our uh, comprehensive uh, heat mitigation and adaptation strategy, we are not only taking actions to reduce the drivers of extreme heat, but we're also taking actions to ensure that we protect the most vulnerable residents um, from the impacts of extreme heat through things like building social cohesion or training home health aides to detect signs of early heat illness. So we want to make sure that as we think about an equitable approach um, to addressing these risks, that we're not only reducing the impacts, um, the disproportionate impacts of climate change on certain populations, but also ensuring that we're distributing benefits in an equitable way. So to address all of these challenges, um, in 2015, Mayor de Blasio released the One NYC Plan, and it builds on previous plans and lays out a vision for um, our developing, addressing our most pressing challenges. The plan has four visions, um, a growing and thriving New York City, uh, that New York City will continue to be the world's most dynamic and ur dynamic urban economy where families, businesses, and, and neighborhoods thrive. A just and equitable city in which New York City will have an inclusive, equitable economy that offers well-paying jobs and opportunity for all to live with dignity and security. A sustainable city in which New York City will be the most sustainable big city in the world and a global leader in the fight against climate change. And a resilient city 
um, in which our neighborhoods, economy, and public services are ready to withstand and emerge stronger from the impacts of climate change. And within the resilience vision, there are four goals. Um, one that's focused on neighborhoods um, and, and building neighborhoods that are safer um, and strengthening community, social, and economic resiliency. Uh, buildings, essentially we're upgrading buildings against climate change impacts. Infrastructure, to ensure that critical services can continue with minimal disruptions. And coastal defense. Uh, New York City has 520 miles of coastline, and so we're uh, working to protect our coastlines from the risks of flooding and sea level rise. Um, and this map in particular shows um, our investments across the city. So we are, my office currently spearheads a $20 billion uh, resilience uh, portfolio of projects across the city. Um, all the projects are spread out across all five boroughs. Um, in, in the coastal protection realm, we have uh, strong partnerships with the Army Corps of Engineers, with FEMA, and with HUD. Um, I think one important thing to note in terms of design is that there is no silver bullet solution. Each neighborhood offers its own uh, challenges and opportunities because of its topography, its um, uh, waterfront uses, and so we're really working actively with communities to determine what are the best solutions. And as we do that, we're also aiming to achieve co-benefits, um, such as improved waterfront access, recreational amenities, and li more livable neighborhoods. So this is a um, rendering. This is a, a rendering from a, a project um, on the east side of Lower Manhattan called the Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project. This project was jump-started by a grant through the Rebuild by Design competition from HUD, um, and we've also invested significant city capital into this project. Um, essentially, this project will create flood protection for 110,000 vulnerable New Yorkers, 10 public housing developments, and protect thousands of jobs and commercial corridors. Um, it extends, it's a 2.5 mile uh, project that extends from Montgomery Street all the way up to 25th Street. Um, and uh, it, a big footprint of the project overlaps with East, um, East River Park, where we're building a flood wall um, towards the back of the park and then elevating the park um, to create improved waterfront access and um, improved recreational amenities. Um, this is an existing uh, picture of the Delancey Street Bridge crossing the FDR um, into, the, into the park. You'll see here, this is a rendering of um, what the project would look like. Uh, this bridge is built for universal access. Um, you can see that uh, you know, it, it, um, it, the improved waterfront access as well as recreational space. Um, and just under the bridge, you'll see the flood wall coming across. And then this is what it would look like in a storm surge event um, where the, the park might flood. And of course, we're um, building the, the park to uh, be floodable and recover quickly. So as we implement these projects, we're also very invested in considering how we can embed resilience considerations into city actions and investments. Um, and this is a more of a policy approach. Um, as I mentioned at the start, last year we released our climate resiliency design guidelines, um, which use data from the uh, New York City Panel on Climate Change and essentially leverage the billions of dollars we are already spending on capital projects to build a more resilient city. So instead of thinking of resilience projects in a silo, we're integrating resilience thinking across everything the city already does. Um, the, the guidelines take data for extreme heat, extreme precipitation, coastal storms, and sea level rise, and provide guidance to designers and engineers on how to use that data in order to incorporate them into capital projects, both building and infrastructure projects. Um, and this, by the way, these guidelines were required by a local law that was um, uh, issued in 2012. And, the big difference between um, these guidelines and building codes is that building codes rely on historic data. And so the guidelines take forward-looking data and essentially ask um, uh, designers and engineers to build above code. Uh, my office has released the sort of overarching guidelines um, that will uh, guide, guide our capital uh, projects moving forward, but city agencies are now developing more specific guidelines based on their operations and missions. So in terms of who will use the guidelines, these are meant for city 
uh, capitally funded projects at this point. Um, so any new capital construction or major rehab. Um, the, these do not apply to private developments. Um, however, they can certainly be a resource for private developers, um, and, and we certainly encourage them to be used in this way. We also did not include coastal protection projects in these guidelines at this time because there are specific requirements by FEMA and, um, and felt that they needed their own attention. Um, so where we are in the process of uh, developing and socializing these guidelines is just last Friday, we released version two of these guidelines after a year of pilot testing on a series of projects. Um, we're going to continue pilot testing because we want to understand the fiscal impact of these guidelines as well as uh, make sure that they are as clear and usable as possible. So we will continue that process. Um, so this will be an evolving document, an evolving tool. We will also uh, update these guidelines every time Time there are new projections. Um, so every time the New York City on Panel on Climate Change releases updated projections, they will be reflected in these guidelines. Um, uh, but at, at the moment, you can find uh, version two of the guidelines on the New York City uh, Mayor's Office of Recovery and Resiliency website. Um, and uh, like I said, it will continue to be a living document. Thank you. Thank you, Janie. And now we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Jennifer Harado, who is the Chief Resiliency Officer at Broward County, which is in the Fort Lauderdale area, South Florida, about uh, what uh, Broward County and others are doing. Hi, thank you. And thanks, too, for the invitation to participate today. I've really enjoyed the um, discussion thus far with the morning panel and, and uh, the colleagues on today's panel. It's always a learning opportunity. Um, I'll be talking about some of our efforts down in Southeast Florida, um, involving the collaboration of four counties on climate resilience. I'll talk a little bit about how our uh, efforts have expanded to uh, really um, uh, integrate more of the economic resilience uh, discussion, and I'll give some um, specific examples of how we're translating some of the regional guidance to local initiatives to support resilient investments in, in my community. For those who are not familiar, uh, we've already identified the four counties from Palm Beach down into Monroe, the Florida Keys, that constitute the four county uh, area that uh, subsequently participated in the formation of the Southeast Florida Regional Climate Change Compact. We share a lot in the way of geographic circumstance. We're coastal uh, communities, pretty heavily developed. Uh, we're one of the fastest growing regions. People continue to move into Southeast Florida despite the cost of living and some of the hazards that that make it a challenging environment. Um, some of the pressures that we have from climate change are not necessarily new, but it's an increased severity and frequency of the types of events that we're um, typically accustomed to. And some of our vulnerability is really focused on the fact that we're very flat, low-lying, subject to storm surge, difficult to move water off the landscape, we have a porous geology that responds to hydrologic manipulations, including what's happening with sea level rise. So we have water coming in from the sides and up from below. Very challenging for flood protection. We rely on a very uh, elaborate uh, canal system for drainage and flood control. That system is uh, nearly entirely dependent upon gravity, meaning that we move water from a higher elevation inland to a lower elevation in the coastal waters. And as that slope declines with sea level rise, we have less of an ability to move water off our landscape. So it's a very uh, tenuous flood circumstance. Uh, we also share a lot in the way of uh, interest in the protection and restoration of critical natural resources, including the Everglades to our west, our coral reefs to the east. And we know that a lot of what happens with um, our own urban adaptation strategies can really dictate what happens next for additional pressures on the natural environment. So regional coordination ends up being uh, real important. I'm going to talk today, though, most about sea level rise, severe weather, and flood risk, but I don't want to diminish any of the other climate impacts that we know to be um, just as, as paramount in terms of our, our responses. But uh, flood, of course, is something that's easily grasped because the reality is right in front of us. And we have um, diverse exposures, including increased um, 
um, uh, erosion of our shorelines, impacts on infrastructure. This event from uh, post Sandy, we actually had a lot of beach loss during Sandy. A month later, we had a high tide and, and some prevailing uh, onshore winds that scoured the remaining beach away, and we had more than a thousand feet of roadway that just collapsed a month later. But we can tie it back to these increased pressures where we have less time to recover and our shorelines less time to recover, so it increases our exposure with even lesser events. We see this increase in rainfall intensity. Increasingly, we're not talking just about the one in a hundred year storm event or the one in 500 year storm event. We're actually talking about the one in a thousand year storm event, receiving more than 20 inches of rainfall in a single day. That's a third of the water that we would receive over the course of a year falling in just a day's time. Massive flooding, massive community disruption. We had an event in the western part of our community that resulted in three days of closure of a major commercial Institute, the Sawgrass Mills of America, loss of $30 million in three days in economic revenue that allows us to talk more and more about the economic implications of these severe events. And then, of course, we have the type of tidal flooding that we're increasingly familiar with. Um, so when we are um, in, in, in looking at the future conditions and its implications for flood hazard, really talking about the combined effects of sea level rise changes in our groundwater table that are a result of our porous geology. It reduces water storage in our soil, so when it rains, it floods more quickly and the flood levels are higher. And this increased intensity in rainfall events and really trying to um, uh, uh, synthesize what all that means when you look at it in an integrated manner. But we've got to these issues of um, increased exposure that are not just specific to Southeast Florida. And as we've heard, you, you need to take advantage of these learning uh, moments to really expand the conversation. And so we can look at all those hazards combined with increased winds. And Irma was a learning experience for our state. I don't think that there's been a storm that had as diverse of implications. We had storm surge. We had rainfall-induced flooding up in Jacksonville. We had um, surge that impacted the entire West Coast. We had fire. Um, and then it, with both residential and commercial losses, our state is now, I think, we have business owners who have uh, land uh, holdings across the state, 700 properties, many of which were impacted with this one storm. So the state's engaging more in a conversation about flood risk, investments, and resilience planning, and looking to organize better support for local communities. And while the, slow, the, the state are, itself has been a little bit slower to respond, we know uh, comprehensively not just the state and, and our region, or not just the region, but the state as a whole, there is a, a significant case for immediate action. Because of the fact that we are continuing to grow so much, we expect uh, we see growth rates in the way of um, jobs exceeding national averages. And, and, and another compelling figure for us is that uh, when we looked at the economic exposure associated with storm surge and a 100-year storm event back in 2008, compared to a reanalysis 10 years later, we found a 40% increase in the economic exposure. Not because sea level rise projections had altered so much, but because we have so much development taking place and the increase in the value of those properties is increasing that exposure. Additionally, with all these people moving into the region, there's a lot of in infrastructure investment that's taking place, and it's a lost opportunity with each dollar spent when we fail to integrate resilience into that infrastructure uh, design. So it's something that we're trying to scramble to address. Uh, that has brought the four counties of Southeast Florida together to um, better align our efforts and try to accelerate investments and planning by sharing resources across the area. Um, in 2009, we adopted a compact that focuses on shared mitigation and adaptation challenges, and we agreed to collaborate in four key areas, um, climate and energy policy at the state and federal levels, develop common baselines for planning, such as emissions inventories, vulnerability assessments, and a sea level rise projection. We agreed to develop a regional action plan that would provide the framework for how we plan and invest locally. And we agreed to get together on an annual basis with all the stakeholders to assess our progress and set a course for the coming years. There are a um, number of, um, you know, I'm, I'm I feel like there was a change here. I'm not sure that the right presentation came up, but anyway, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, I'll plug through it. There are a number of um, uh, tools that have been developed, but one of the most significant ones that we point to is the regional sea level rise projection. 
This was created once with a, a task uh, force very similar to what uh, was constituted in New York, uh, agency experts, university experts, and uh, water managers and climate scientists, etc. We updated the projection uh, with the fourth Nas uh, national climate assessment and all the literature that comes out at that time. And we asked these regional experts to uh, aid us in looking at the downscaling for uh, application specific to our region. So today, this is the second time all four counties and about half of our cities have formally adopted this projection for planning purposes. It's now used by consultants throughout our region. It's referred to by our academic and agency partners. And uh, it is just widely referenced. We generally we clearly look at the scenarios, but we generally plan for two feet of sea level rise by 2060, acknowledging, of course, that sea level will continue to rise. Uh, we have a, a, the, the similar scenarios for 2100, and we appreciate, too, that there are some investments that have a shorter lifetime, and so maybe looking at a shorter term uh, horizon is appropriate. But again, the default tends to be two feet and, um, and uh, by 2060. We have moved forward uh, after developing these regional tools with a regional action plan. That action plan uh, was completed and adopted in 2012. We just updated that five-year document as well. Uh, in 2017, we released an update at our ninth annual compact summit. So we've been convening annually since, uh, since the 2009 timeframe. And we expanded our action plan to include focal areas on economic resilience, equity, um, public health uh, subject areas that we had not taken up adequately the first time around, and we created something more of a web-based tool rather, rather than a hard copy document to improve accessibility. I'd like to talk about, uh, and I'm going to delve into these issues of economic resilience in a moment, but I want to talk a little bit about how we have taken some of the planning process at the regional level and begun to apply it at the local level. And this has been a process of evolution because we didn't necessarily have all the tools at hand um, that are available today when we were just initiating, but we didn't want to lose opportunities to influence land use and investment decisions. We've also really sought to maximize the legal authority of our county. We're a charter county and we have countywide authority on issues of land use and also water quality. So the extent to anything that we're doing in the climate resilience realm, we can tie back to those authorities. That's where we have the ability to dictate more of the regional standards. We began with establishing a priority planning area map. Uh, that's the, the graphic um, with the, the pink on it. And it just looked at land elevation relative to sea level rise. It's very preliminary because we know that flood risk is far more extensive because of the issues of our water management system and our geology. But it's where we started. So any land use decision that came in would be subject to a review for resilience if it fell within this pink area. We also worked as a region to influence our state law. We um, amended, uh, we were able to push legislation that amended the Growth Management Act that now allows local governments to establish adaptation action areas. These are areas vulnerable to the impacts of sea level rise or hydrologically connected with areas vulnerable to sea level rise. And it allows for prioritizing of projects and funding in order to see investments accelerated. We have cities throughout the area who have, or wait, one city who has adopted a number of adaptation action areas within their planning area based on stormwater improvements. Broward County has adopted an action area based upon shoreline resilience. Other communities outside the region have used the same designation to protect natural areas as buffers against climate impacts. So those are some of the ways that we've moved forward, but the applications are not just specific to the developer. We have also required that cities that are responsible for servicing or providing infrastructure that will service the property also provide responses in this review of how, how they're aligning their planning and investments consistent with the same desire, um, uh, design considerations. This last year was a really a pivotal year as well, and that we moved forward with an amendment to our code of ordinances that now establishes a future conditions map series. And this was important because prior to that, we'd have this projection with a sea level rise, and we're not didn't have the expertise necessarily represented across all 31 of our cities and the consultants who were working for those cities to translate that projection to design criteria. And we were seeing stormwater improvement plans moving forward with no contemplation of the fact that groundwater was rising and the design systems would not function as they were predicted based upon historic maps. 
So we established this future conditions map series and we set up a timeline for addressing three critical areas of need, drainage infrastructure, coastal flood barriers or flood walls, and our flood maps themselves. We did move forward this last year uh, with the update of our groundwater elevation map. This sets the standard for drainage infrastructure. Uh, we worked with the USGS to model the predictive response of the groundwater levels with 2.5 feet of sea level rise. We developed a new map that you can click on anywhere and get the new future condition groundwater elevation for the 2060 to 2069 timeframe. And this would establish design standards for say front drains, drainage wells, retention areas, et cetera, and ensure that that property can manage its water on site into future uh, decades. The graphic on the bottom right shows, and it's west to east across the same that cross section, uh, west to east, you can see the historic groundwater elevation in dashed blue, the new groundwater elevation with two feet sea level rise in dark blue, solid line, and then the red line is the land elevation. So you can see as the land elevation and the groundwater elevation intersect, that's where you have no, really no storage or substantially reduced storage that could influence uh, the design of the drainage uh, system for flood protection. We went through a number of case scenarios to look at the cost implications and site-specific projects, estimated that at about 0.6 to 1.6 percent for a construction project. And we were able to move forward uh, after substantial workshops, but move forward with that amendment without any opposition from the uh, regulated community. We're now working on a project with the Army Corps of Engineers, coupling hydrodynamic modeling of two feet sea level rise, high tides, high frequency storm surge, like the events we see every 10 to 25 years, um, and combining those influences, because it's never just one influence, and the predicted high tides are always less than what's realized. So we see it compounded by supermoons and slowing of the Gulf Stream and offshore storm systems off Bermuda. So we're combining all of those to say what's going to be a reasonable standard for a holistic standard on our seawalls across the region um, and taking into account the economics in terms of um, the, not just the avoided losses, but the economic activity associated with those same areas. This has allowed us um, in bringing in the services of RMS to assess risk a little bit differently. And these are preliminary because they're major surge events and we don't necessarily design all infrastructure around sur surges of this magnitude. But it does allow us to kind of alter the conversation in terms of if we're accustomed or comfortable with historically planning for an event that has a 1% probability on any given year, and that, that assumed exposure is 22 million, but with three feet of sea level rise, or excuse me, two feet of sea level rise, if that exposure increases to 440 million, this study looked at just these two communities. Are we prepared to deal with an exposure of 440 million on an annual basis? Or do we want to look at how we can alter our infrastructure in this modeled environment to reduce those exposures? So it's, a, again, kind of altered the way we can look at that risk. Uh, this graphic is slightly skewed, but uh, what it shows preliminarily is that if we look at a holistic upgrade of our seawalls to a four to six foot NAVD standard, it allows us to mitigate a lot of the risk associated with events that have a higher frequency probability, but probably not so much those events that have um, a, a lesser um, frequency, but a more significant impact. So then we have to look at what are some of the other solutions. And I think it really reveals that it's diverse solutions. You know, we need to be looking at raising our seawalls, upgrading our stormwater management systems, elevating infrastructure, building uh, new storage into our communities, investments that are all taking place today, and increasing our flood elevations. We are in the process of advancing a study now that um, integrates sea level rise and updates to our 100-year flood map. Um, we have nine cities that are participating financially in that study, and it will not be used for setting um, insurance rates, but it is the design standard or will be used as the design standard in our community. And we have always built to a higher standard. We've assumed build out of our community and we've required that, um, that those new standards be in place for decades. But what we have found with the development in the community and the change in hydrology, the FEMA flood map has uh, begun to um, run parallel with what was always our kind of like our futuristic map. 
So this update is necessary, um, and we can talk about the prudence of making this investment because of the NFIP program in large part. These are operational costs when we look at flood insurance and whether or not, the, and, and there's so much uncertainty about what's going to happen with flood insurance, and there's great concern. If flood insurance accounts for 10% of a mortgage today, but it's potentially 40% of a mortgage tomorrow, what does that do to the real estate market? What does it do to the value of the investment um, by a developer? Developer who's working to you know build new units what does it do with regards to workforce housing and and how viable your your economic condition will be so we're working to organize resources around this issue to insulate and protect against uncertainties and not only in flood risk but the financial implications of the NFIP which is core to our housing market and working to uh, um, ensure that we're addressing credits as part of the community rating system that helps keep flood insurance affordable, hopefully, while we're building up. Um, this conversation has not been lost on the business development community and the economic community. For years, we've talked about future risk and future losses, and it just doesn't resonate when you're talking with people who are investing money today. But they do understand that the investment of today needs to be marketable in three years, and they know about the importance of investing in infrastructure that supports their historic investments. and. Uh, when we began taking up the issue of this new action plan, the update, not only were they heavily engaged, but they jumped at the opportunity to part in this partner in the last summit that we titled the Business of Resilience. And the business community um, um, uh, 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 demonstrated that support with a rollout of a statement of collaboration on economic resilience that ties into the regional compact. They engaged our media outlets. Right now on May 6th, we have all three major print media and WLRN who have committed to a one-year sustained investment in climate education and sea level rise solutions and resources for the community. That would not have happened had it not been for the engagement of the economic uh, interests in our region. And they understand, too, that this is also about um, you know, finance rates. As we talk about bond rating for communities and how are we addressing resilience, that trickles into the cost of the um, private investment and development. So that conversation is being held too. So I'll conclude in noting that this private sector engagement is going to be key not only for the community conversation, but compelling local governments to make the right decision, making sure that as we move forward with bond financing, that flood infrastructure is part of that, and we're not just talking about police stations, gaining more in the way of federal state engagement, and really ensuring that we move forward with holistic plans that are fully integrating of systems and, and looking at um, spatially and temporar temporarily um, phased investments that are part of more of a community-wide strategy. Meanwhile, we don't lose um, opportunities on investments that are taking place today by addressing the resilient standards as part of our own regulatory process. So with that, I'll conclude, and hopefully there will be time for questions. Thank right. you. So there's been a few quite a bit of information given in a short amount of time. Um, I hope all of you have been able to comprehend all of it. There will be a quiz shortly after. Only, it is law school, after all. Um, but our next speaker um, actually is a questioner, Chris Flavelle from Bloomberg News, who gets paid to ask questions and is hopefully going to raise some discussion here. Hi, uh, thanks so much for having me. What a great event. Um, so my name is Christopher Flavelle. I cover, uh, I cover what I call the climate adaptation beat, which is uh, specifically looking at um, not, not the emissions that drive climate change, but the effects of climate change and how governments and businesses and developers respond to those pressures or sometimes don't respond to those pressures. Uh, and I love that beat because it seems in the time I've been covering it to be sort of defined by inherent tensions, right? Fundamental tensions. One of them is this country is built on growth and on building and on homes and on a degree of freedom that climate adaptation at its core begins to challenge it. It sort of it presents new challenges to where we can build and how we build and whether the market can be as freewheeling as it has been historically. Uh, so I'm, I'm thrilled to have the chance to ask Janie and Jennifer some questions on how their respective offices think about those questions. Uh, I, I, I ask 
I'll ask those questions sort of looking at the future, knowing that there are no good answers. I think that what, what makes this topic so interesting is there are no easy answers. Um, hopefully, I can ask just, just the right questions. But first, Elena, if I can ask you, I, I had no idea. I'm also not a lawyer. I had no idea um, to what degree the liability facing developers, builders, architects, engineers is growing. Um, I, I come at this from the vantage point of someone who talks to builders, uh, in particular home builders. And um, I, I, help me understand this because when I talk to home builders, I don't get any impression that they are grappling with the fear or the reality of increasing liability. Rather, I sense, I sense the opposite. I sense a group of people who are pushing to um, keep building codes from becoming more stringent, uh, who want to, and this is not pejorative, who want to build to the lowest cost possible, who, who, want, who don't want pressure to think about future risk. Um, and when they do think about future risk, uh, they will present it as something they don't have to do, something that they're doing because they are sort of altruistic or especially forward-looking, but not because they're responding to pressure. They just think it's a good idea. Um, help, me, help me make sense of those two seemingly um, uh, divergent streams here. Is it that the pressure that you're describing hasn't filtered down yet, or are they choosing to ignore it? Let's see. Like, is this is this on? Yeah. Okay. Um, we are finding the same thing, uh, and that's part of the reason why we issued this report and why we are kind of going on an educational tour, if you will. Uh, we are going to be speaking on this topic at the uh, national. Uh, American lands Arch uh, Landscape Architects uh, Conference this year. We're going to be speaking at the National uh, Engineer uh, Professional Group Conference this year as well because what we are finding is that uh, people in that community are shocked by the fact that compliance with the code alone does not necessarily shield them from liability. And I think that our motivation is less about bringing actual cases, but more about using the um, legal exposure as a lever to motivate and incentivize this regulated community to go to the drafters of the code and demand that the code be risen such mm -hmm. that it is actually contemplating climate change. And um, it's similar to what um, Jennifer is talking about with economic exposure and how that brought the business community to the table. We see that, that the same thing could happen with the design and build community when they acknowledge and, and understand their liability exposure, that it could really motivate more action mm -hmm. and make it something that they're not just thinking they're doing to be altruistic, but something that they actually owe their clients as a standard of care. I'm going to shift to this side in, in five seconds, but first, real quick, what's the response been so far? From, from builders and designers and architects, engineers, are they, are they happy to hear that they are now facing this uh, additional liability risk and they've got to <laughs> change their business model? I'm going to assume that's a rhetorical question. Um, How unhappy are they? <laughs> uh, well, I'm used to getting uh, disgruntled reactions as a lawyer uh, to the advice and, and information that we're handing out. Uh, and I would say that it's been one of uh, surprise and uh, questioning and intrigue, hmm. uh, not much pushback, more uh, actually, wow, this is a gap. And uh, we've been seeing, as I said, we didn't go to those regional associations of landscape architects and engineers. We've been approached by them. Hmm. They have found this report and they're worried and they want to learn more. Okay. Uh, Janie, you're up next. Okay. Uh, so I talked to somebody last week who made the point, I'd heard it before, but it was especially well made, uh, that if you really want to talk about climate adaptation that's meaningful, the only thing that, that will reduce our exposure and prevent really catastrophic damage is if somebody identifies the areas where the climate risk is so severe, you just shouldn't build. And if you have built there, then if the stuff gets destroyed, you don't rebuild it. You don't intensify it. You don't invest more money in it. You just set a line. And, and he, he immediately said, and that will never happen because local officials can't afford to because they can't, the, the, 
the foundation of almost any jurisdiction is so heavily tied to its real estate market and development that it's almost, it's almost implausible to have them do that. Um, but what the reason I raised it is this was not some uh, radical environmentalist making this point. Uh, it was a senior executive at a major reinsurance company. And he said, until that happens, we, we will not fix this. I don't want to put you on the spot and ask about New York, but at a conceptual level, do you agree with the premise that there are some parcels of land where the climate risk, whether it's storm surge or flooding or wildfires or whatever, is so great that it doesn't merit development? And if, if the answer is yes, what's a reasonable way to determine those plots of land? What's, what's the right standard to set, do you think? Well, I'm actually happy to answer in the New York context because we've started asking these questions ourselves. Um, we actually, so we've been, our Department of Housing, Preservation and Development led a uh, uh, extensive planning process in a community called Engineer in the Rockaways. Mm -hmm. um, this is a very vulnerable community, um, also yeah. a, a low income community. Um, and so there was a participatory process to identify how to address the challenges this community faces from tidal flooding and ponding, but also all the other challenges this community faces, um, uh, whether it's uh, you know lack of reliable transit, uh, sort of insufficient commercial corridors, things like that. Um, and so through this extensive public engagement process, they put out a resilient engineer plan. As part of the plan, they did identify through a public engagement process, areas of the community that are so susceptible to not only sea level rise and tidal flooding, but wave action, that it didn't make sense to rebuild in those in those areas. So the only housing recovery strategy um, that was offered in those areas was relocation. Mm -hmm. um, those areas, you know, I will admit, were um, small, very targeted. Um, but uh, but it was a start to a conversation, and it happened through intensive public engagement. Uh, similarly, our Department of City Planning has uh, created a new zoning designation called the Special Coastal Risk District, where the only option um, for development is uh, de-densification, essentially. Um, and so that also happened through intensive public engagement. Um, we have three Special Coastal Risk Districts designated now, uh, but it's a start to that conversation. It's a very difficult conversation, I will admit, um, but we're, it's important to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh Jennifer, I was talking to Craig Fugate earlier this month, uh, and he mentioned that Florida, former FEMA head, he mentioned that Florida is, is sort of doubly, doubly um, challenged. Number one, it's got the incredible array of climate risks that you went through, which terrify me every time I hear them. Uh, but number two, it's got an economy that is especially dependent on real estate. Uh, and, and he said, you know, he was exaggerating a bit, but he said no one in Florida has yet figured out how to, how to achieve the level of growth that they see as desirable without without constant heavy development almost everywhere in Florida, uh, and he said that's part of the you, you can't you can't understand the challenges in Florida without understanding the sort of crucial economic characteristic of the region. To what degree uh, are the policies that your office pursues constrained by the economic necessity of of development, and do you do you feel like um, Broward County has has been able to find a balance between not wanting to uh, kneecap its own economic growth, but also want to take take these risks seriously and and take appropriate steps. How how do you approach mm -hmm. those two competing forces? Mm -hmm. Well, I I don't um, you know, I don't think that we're there yet. I can point to fairly recent um, developments that I don't think that we would argue to be attractive uh, today. Um, but the, the, the difficulty in large part is that um, many of these developments have permits that have been active for some time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and you know, so there are certain you know, development rights that exist. Until, in my opinion, and there are lots of ways to get at it, but if we start putting into place the more progressive requirements for flood protection. I think that that'll drive some of what needs to take place because, for example, a couple of years ago, there was one of these presentations before one of our coastal municipalities, and one of the commissioners had uh, inquired about the prudence in uh, having advanced a project given these flood realities, and the staff member 
he said, well, shouldn't we be designing and requiring more? And the staff member's response was, well, you already know that we don't have enough space to do what's required. What more could we possibly do? Right. But of course, if the provision is in there that you don't get to choose any longer, mm -hmm. that it's just applied, now pretty quick you decide that you can't make that investment mm -hmm. viable in the same way because of the smaller project <laughs> footprint mm -hmm. that you have to um, design in order to be able to accommodate the other flood protection provisions, or if you're designing other um, uh, infrastructure in a manner that it's no longer compatible with the, 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 the design built, the design for that site, it may not be, it may not fit into the landscape. And ultimately, I think that there will have to be a question about if you can no longer design the, the, the development that you wanted under these new flood provisions, then you either change that development, which may be this, de you know, the de-densification, altered use, or you build it somewhere else. Yeah. So, um, but, but getting the regulatory, in my mind, getting the regulatory tools in place, so incentives are nice, but the development community consider those rightfully elective, mm -hmm. and if somebody else has a competitive advantage, they'll take exception with yeah. it. But they are willing, in my assessment, to come along so long as there are cons there's consistency in what's required. I've got one last question I've got to ask, and then I'll open up if we have time to questions from the audience. Um, you mentioned, Jane, Jane, that there's no silver bullet. Uh, I feel compelled to be, for a moment, the voice of floodplain managers and emergency managers who would say, oh no, there is a silver bullet, it's called buyouts. Uh, and we heard about the option to manage retreat. Uh, it is thus far unpopular. Um, but I think it's a process, right? And I assume the manager retreat becomes less unpalatable as the risk grows. Uh, to what degree do your respective offices currently engage in thinking about or talking about some version of manager retreat? Do you identify areas? that are most vulnerable? Do you, do you talk about the mechanism? Do you talk about funding? Or is there planning underway? Uh, and, and what is the state of that planning for retreat in your respective jurisdictions? Sure. I mean, you know, I disagree with the idea that buyouts are a silver bullet, but we won't go into that right now. I mean, I think that we've got to find the right balance of keeping the water out and living with water, essentially. And I think that, um, you know, we're working on that. And I, I, I think I got to that in my previous answer. You know, we've got some tools now, like the Special Coastal Risk District designation, that help us um, think, think about that and enforce uh, a sort of a different uh, approach to development. We also, New York City, um, along with the state and um, federal agencies, manage several buyout programs in the wake of Sandy. Mm -hmm. And I think we've learned a lot from those programs. Um, we've learned about the importance of community engagement uh, in advance of a disaster. Mm -hmm. um, we've learned, learned a lot about the importance of coordination. And ultimately, what kind of buy-in is needed in order to really make a program like that effective. Um, and so we're, we're taking those lessons seriously. And there's actually a city council legislated Sandy recovery task force that we're about to engage in that um, will give us a venue to really take those lessons um, and, and develop a strategy for what might happen next time. Jennifer, is, is Broward County engaged in some degree of something that you would call planning for retreat? Uh, it's very limited. Um, we, it, we've undertaken special projects with like the Naval Academy to look at criteria that might be um, established. I mean, we, we did develop criteria that would be established and applied um, in advance of uh, uh, a disaster to help better guide a process, but um, I, I still consider a lot of that exercises, and I don't think that I would claim that there's anything a real substance that would be framed with, ad, with sufficiently with sea level rise considerations in mind. Okay. Uh, shall we do questions? So we got a few minutes for questions. <coughs> right here. Um, I have a question, which is. Part for Lena, but it's really for the whole panel. It occurs to me that that if you're worried about liability, or building a case for potential liability, there are two other issues uh, that have been mentioned here. One been mentioned that could um, sort of factors that could play into that. One are the New York City guidelines uh, for sustainable design. Essentially, they will not be code requirements, but they could well be seen as state-of-the-art standards, and the violation of them could indeed be seen as the basis for liability. So they're, while they're not legally binding by the city, they could in fact be enforced by insurance companies, for example. 
The second would be um, environmental impact statements, where climate change and climate impacts have to be disclosed as part of an EIS, which is increasingly the case, certainly in New York and elsewhere. Uh, you would think that ignoring an identified risk in the course of designing a project would also be a basis for potential liability. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, there was a case in Chicago uh, where an insurance company brought a claim on behalf of its uh, customers against the city of Chicago and other uh, municipalities because the city of Chicago's climate action plan identified increased precipitation as a known coming down the pike impact from climate change and the city had identified needing to upgrade its stormwater infrastructure to handle that rain and it had not done so and as a result there was extreme flooding which caused harm and re resulted in the insurance company needing to cover that damage that suit was ultimately um, dropped and we don't we, we, we don't exactly know why. I think there was political pressure involved and there would have been a big uh, sovereign immunity challenge to surmount. Um, but absolutely, my point was that you know, courts will look at a variety of factors and that something like the New York City's guidelines would absolutely come into play even if it was not a required code element. Uh, at, at the back, went up first. Yes, hi, thank you. So going back to the slide of the octopus, The other elephant in the room was just mentioned when you talk about professional liability, which is insurance. And my question is, how do professionals uh, getting malpractice insurance, how much insurance do they need? And then the other side of that coin is if you're a client looking to make sure your indemnification clause is really viable, how much insurance do you require your design I don't know if that question is directed at me necessarily, but I, I feel like sitting through this presentation and today that I just told myself I'd like someone to host another uh, conference where insurance folks are invited because, uh, and I, have, I think those, are, those have happened and I just haven't been to one lately, um, but I really feel like a lot of fingers keep pointing back to insurance. And um, I've heard varying things. I've, I've heard that insurance companies only have annual, uh, annual terms and they don't take the long term into account and that it's really reinsurance companies that are going to need to drive the, drive the needle here. Um, but when it comes to professional liability and indemnification, I get to just point out the problems, but I don't actually have to sit down with my design professional client and talk to solution, talk to them about solutions. So I invite people in the audience to weigh in if, if they have thoughts. I, I don't have a direct response for that, but I do want to share um, just quickly a, 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 an experience on this uh, project where we had a uh, we had a consultant company that had um, produced a basis of design report for a coastal city uh, valuing the improvements needed at $300 million. And this is not a city that has a lot of money. And so I was asked to review this report in the context of climate impacts and sea level rise. I found no, no reference anywhere in the entire document that, they, that this coastal city where the groundwater elevation has already increased a foot and we already know that systems in this area operate at like 25% of what they operate elsewhere because of these changes. So detailed all this information and the consultant when asked to respond to that said, well, we weren't asked to incorporate that in the, in the evaluation. So, well, you're a professional with sufficient engineering knowledge and everybody knows how these, like the Hippocratic Oath of doing no harm, and you could saddle this community with a $300 million system that's not going to function in three decades. And so I don't, you know, I don't have the answer, but I can certainly see the exposure and that you know, engineering firms, they, they have to be, take, they, have, they have broader geographic context for the work that they're undertaking and have a responsibility to bring it forward. And I think that the, economic, or the, the, the liabilities are sizable. I know a few more popped up. Is it? Okay, let's start here. Thanks. Um, so 
So we've been talking a lot from the perspective of larger developers and municipalities. What about consumers, so homeowners or small business owners who maybe don't have the resources to research as much or absorb a loss? How do we make sure that they have sufficient information when making the decision to purchase the property? Do you want to talk about it? I can just cover you know, the fact that we're, we're really prioritizing consumer education. So we have a citywide uh, blood risk uh, edu education campaign. Um, it's called Blood Risk and Why, or Blood Health and Why, I'm sorry. Um, that not only uh, provides information um, on, on flood risk in any, any particular area of the city, but also has resources attached to it like technical assistance, um, home audits, things like that. And so um, it, it's a part of our strategy to ensure that we have educational resources out there. If I can just make one, one point on that, uh, the House passed a flood insurance bill last year that would have required states to require realtors to disclose flood risk. Um, it didn't it didn't pass the Senate generated I think some concern among the real estate community uh, I, I I don't you know predictions are not worth much but the pressure for that kind of change won't stop maybe at some point it'll go somewhere that's when I think you know when, it, when it's mandated you'll see a change so there are also some states that are endeavoring to um, pass laws that would insert uh, the status of flood risk into the title of the uh, property, so it would show up in a title search. Mm. Right here. So you said some reference here to the need for some regulatory development and so forth, and it sounds like folks in, in South Florida uh, and Albany City, resilience planning and thinking is being layered into the existing regulatory scheme. So here put up that. Uh, one page, a four page matrix of all the regulatory requirements that apply to the project on Staten Island. As an environmental permitting attorney, it's a very familiar matrix, so they're not in New York. Uh, are you thinking about layering in these things, or maybe particularly for you know, public projects and regional projects, but not just you know, within the four corners of a particular property? Having any kind of system for cutting through some of that bureaucracy with some sort of regional plan or super authority? Again, that's probably something worth exploring. Um, there was a recent ULI um, event held in South Florida. Um, there, there was a, a, a document that was produced that detailed the like ten recommendations for resilient buildings, but. One of the major complaints of the panelists was that the, the, the assertion that the regulatory process was the constraint. Um, I'm not sure if it's the local re re regulatory process. Could be the case. It was the first time that we had heard that. But um, oftentimes it is the state building code. And in our case, um, so this is building code specific, but there are a lot of uh, local government um, uh, restrictions with regards to, to that particular process. Um, I, I think I need to explore in the Florida example to the extent that it's really a, a, a regional constraint or something else. I'm not sure. I will say one other incentive that could be offered and I'm, I've heard discussed is uh, streamlining the permit process for resiliency projects. Um, it's a public policy decision whether you want to give that uh, that flexibility and how you choose what projects get streamlined, but uh, I've seen that been discussed. I'm told we have five minutes left, so maybe time for two questions right, right at the back. Thank you. Uh, I'm returning to the question of uh, financial innovation when it comes to the uh, flood risk and the question of You guys seen that? Uh, in the last several weeks, I've heard whisperings that um, there have been some private development uh, opportunities where the financial partner might have been asking questions along those lines.
but I don't know the information, you know, I don't know it firsthand, but it seems that it, 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 that conversation may be growing. And speaking with the um, South Florida Mortgage Brokers Association about a year ago, um, it was not a conversation that they were having. They didn't see the exposure. We had a real estate finance entity at our climate summit also unable to really speak to that issue. I, I don't know what their internal conversations are. But I'm publicly, they're they're not saying it. I agree. I think there are pockets of activity, but I don't think that they're certainly far from mainstream and um, and it's still pretty isolated. Uh, but there are certainly people thinking about um, and creating some guides around uh, lending for resilience and that kind of thing. But uh, far from from widely accepted. We are seeing, of course, the bond rating agencies waking up to this, though Moody's and others. Mm. One more, one more time. Oh, I hate doing this. Um, <laughs> at random, at the edge. Sorry, everybody else. Thanks. Um, a question in Southeast Florida: Has there been a harmonization of the regu regulations or codes to um, address development of people from county to county among the four counties who are members of the compact? Um. So the. Not, not sufficiently, no. Um, at, at the local level, the zoning is at the municipal level, and there is not, definitely not consistency across the municipalities. Um, on our approach with the uh, groundwater uh, elevation map, both Miami-Dade and uh, Broward have worked with the USGS on the hydrologic modeling. Uh, we did work very closely with their staff to share all of our approach, and we believe that they may be launching a similar uh, 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 amendment and ability to navigate, so it should look very uniform. Um, but I think that the initial discussions that they had, maybe there wasn't a whole lot of excitement around it, but I think that the pressure is becoming so great that they'd be responsive in this area, and the cities want it. The cities are asking the county to be more assertive on this point. So I think it'll come along, and I think that the sharing of the uh, circumstance in, in our community where we were able to do it without uh, what I consider really any hiccups, I think that that uh, you know it helps to build confidence that about our neighboring our, our neighbors' ability to do it. And I think again, these types of issues we move you know like property assessed clean energy took one community five years to do it, but once one community did, everybody else was able to get it done in, in a year's time. So I think it's okay that it didn't happen instantaneous in time, but I think it'll come together relatively quickly because of our ability to share approaches. Okay. Well, thank you all so much for your attention and your questions. If uh, you want to have more questions, we'll have some folks around for a little bit. We are now going to serve lunch, and we will be adjourned uh, for till after lunch. Thank you. <laughs>